So up until this point, we've been discussing the erythrocytes. Let's now focus our attention on another formed element called the leukocytes. These leukocytes are the only formed elements in blood that contain a nucleus and as well as the usual organelles that we find in a eukaryotic cell. Relative to the platelets and the erythrocytes, these leukocytes only account for 1% of the total blood volume. We don't have very many of them compared to, let's say, the erythrocytes where they number in the millions. So when it comes to the leukocytes, we are in the thousands. So for each microliter of blood, we have about five to 10,000 of these white blood cells. Their main function will be against disease, disease-causing agents, something that we're going to discuss when we look at the lymphatic system and immunity chapter. One thing that is unique to these leukocytes that erythrocytes cannot do is they have the ability to leave blood through a process called diapedesis or emigration. In addition, they respond to what we call chemotaxis, positive chemotaxis. The way I want you to think of chemotaxis is a chemical scent trail. So when cells are dying or they're damaged or stressed, they release chemicals that will attract these leukocytes and they will move towards the area where we find these cells. They are following the so-called scent trail. We'll also see later that toxins and certain disease-causing agents called pathogens will also release certain substances that will attract these leukocytes. There are two main groups when it comes to the leukocytes. We have the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. So the granulocytes have visible cytoplasmic granules. These granules have the ability to soak up or absorb the dye or the stain when we stain our blood. The reason is because these granules are quite dense, making them visible under the microscope. This is what gives them the name granular sites. Whereas with the eight granular sites, their cytoplasmic granules aren't that dense. Therefore, they don't absorb as much of the dye or the stain. As a result, they're not visible under the microscope. Hence the name eight granular sites. So let's look at the granular sites. We have the neutrophils, we have the eosinophils, and we have the basophils. The agranular sites that do not contain visible granules are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Within the lymphocytes, we can further subdivide them into the T cells, the B cells, and the NK cells, which stand for natural killer cells. The granulocytes and the macrophages, also called monocytes, differentiate from the myeloid stem cell line, something that we looked at earlier, while the lymphocytes differentiate from the lymphoid stem cell line. But remember, regardless of the stem cell line that they differentiate from, it all begins as a hemocytoblast or a hematopoietic stem cells found in the red bone marrow. Now, as far as the macrophages and monocytes are concerned, please keep in mind they are one and the same cell. Macrophages are found in tissue. So these macrophages are wandering around among our tissue cells. While if these cells are found in blood, then they're referred to as monocytes. If we quickly look at their numbers, their percent values as far as the makeup of the leukocytes, the neutrophils far outnumber all the other leukocytes. So we're looking at 50 to 70 percent. Then we have the lymphocytes. So they make up about 25 to 45 percent. We then have the monocytes. Remember, monocytes are found in blood, while macrophages are found among our tissue cells, followed by the eosinophils and the basophils. And if we run the centrifuge, where exactly are these leukocytes found? Well, they're found in the Buffy coat. So they're not as dense as erythrocytes, but are denser than the platelets. So as far as their separation after centrifugation was something that we discussed earlier.
Now that we've grouped the leukocytes into agranular sites and granular sites, let's look at the different types of granular sites, beginning with the neutrophils. These neutrophils are sometimes referred to as bacterial slayers because that is their specialty. They go after or they neutralize bacteria that is potentially trying to make us sick. The neutrophils account for most of the white blood cell or leukocyte population, where they account for 50 to 70% of the leukocytes. They are twice the size of your red blood cells and their granules will stain pink. Now, why is that? Well, it has to do with the right stain. So the right stain is used to stain blood smears, bone marrow samples, as well as urine samples. And they're a way to differentiate the types of formed elements, your red blood cells or erythrocytes, your leukocytes, and as well as your platelets. This right stain consists of eosin, which is a red acidic stain, plus methylene blue, which is a blue basic stain. Now, when we combine an acid and a base, in this case, eosin plus methylene blue, it results in a neutralization reaction. Because neutrophils take up both eosin and methylene blue, which results in the pinkish color seen in the cytoplasm, is why they're referred to as neutrophils. So neutrophils for neutralization. They are extremely phagocytic. In fact, these neutrophils are the first leukocytes to arrive at the scene of injury, which we'll further discuss when we look at the lymphatic system and immunity. So let's look at the neutrophil and see what they would look like under the microscope. The nucleus will have about three to five lobes, and if you look carefully here, the cytoplasmic granules will stain pink. So this is incorrect. We should change that. Cytoplasmic granules are visible because they will stain pink. The next type are the eosinophils. They account for about 2 to 4% of all the leukocytes. Their granules will soak up the red stain, the eosin. And because they absorb eosin is why they're referred to as eosinophils. So when we identify them under the microscope, look for those reddish cytoplasmic granules. Their specialty is to attack large parasites, such as parasitic worms. They release enzymes that will digest the surface of these parasitic worms. We're going to look at this once again when we look at the lymphatic system and immunity. They also control inflammation with enzymes that will counteract the inflammation or inflammatory effects of the neutrophils and the mast cells, again, to be discussed later. Now, in addition to their cytoplasmic granules staining red, look for a nucleus that tends to be bilobed. The last of the granulocytes are the basophils. They are the rarest. Why? Because they only account for 0.5 to 1% of all our leukocytes. These basophils contain cytoplasmic granules that will absorb the methylene blue. And because methylene blue is a basic stain, this is what gives basophils its name. And this methylene blue has a very deep bluish color. So their cytoplasmic granules will stain purplish or a deep dark blue color. These basophils will release substances that will result in inflammation. So they release histamine, which is a very potent vasodilator. In other words, it will cause the blood vessels to dilate. So the lumen will increase in size and histamine will attract the leukocytes to the inflamed area or the inflamed site. So this is a good example of positive chemotaxis. They also will release heparin. Heparin will prevent blood clotting. So it's an anticoagulant, something that we're gonna talk about later in this presentation. They are very functionally similar to mast cells. 
The difference is basophils are found in blood while the mast cells are found among our tissue cells. So we're not going to find the mast cells circulating in blood. If we want to look for these mast cells, then we need to look outside of the blood vessel where we find our tissue cells. Their nucleus will have an S shape to them. And if you look at the cytoplasmic granules, they stain very dark blue or dark purple. Let's now look at the eight granular sites that do not contain visible cytoplasmic granules when stained with the right stain. So we begin with the lymphocytes, and these are the second most numerous leukocytes that we have, and they account for 20 to 40 percent of all leukocytes. They have a dark purple circular nucleus, and we can see it right here. Furthermore, they're slightly larger than in the red blood cell. So when compared with the granular sites, where they tend to be twice as large as the red blood cell, the lymphocytes, however, are just slightly bigger than the erythrocyte. They are mostly found in lymphatic tissue, something again that we're going to look at with the lymphatic system and immunity. So lymphatic tissues such as the lymph nodes and the spleen. So rather than circulating in blood, which some do, most of them, however, are found in the lymph nodes and the spleen. These lymphocytes can migrate in and out of blood through a process called emigration, which again we're going to discuss as part of this presentation. These lymphocytes are vital and crucial to immunity. We have three types of lymphocytes. We've got the T lymphocytes, also called the T cells, and they act or mount a response against cells that have been infected by viruses and as well as cancer cells or tumor cells. Then we have the B lymphocytes or B cells. And these B lymphocytes will give rise to what we call plasma cells. B lymphocytes, when they become activated, they will become plasma cells. It is these plasma cells that will produce the antibodies. Then we have natural killer cells, the NK cells. They mount an attack or they respond to cancer cells. The second type of agranular sites are the monocytes. These monocytes are huge. Out of all the leukocytes that are produced in the red bone marrow, these monocytes are the largest. When compared to a red blood cell, this monocyte is about four times bigger. They account for about three to eight percent of all leukocytes that we have. And if we look at the cytoplasm of a monocyte, their cytoplasm stains light blue. Remember, their cytoplasmic granules are not dense, unlike the granulocytes, so not a whole lot of that right stain will be absorbed. The nucleus is U-shaped. Furthermore, these monocytes can leave circulation, in other words, they can leave the blood vessel and enter where we find the cells. And if they do, then now they're referred to as macrophages. And again, we touched on this in an earlier slide. They are very, very phagocytic, just like the neutrophils. However, the monocytes in blood and macrophages in tissue, they arrive after the neutrophils. So first come the neutrophils, followed by the monocytes or macrophages. They are crucial because these cells attack viruses, intracellular parasites, and are associated with chronic infections. The monocytes will also secrete substances that will activate the lymphocytes, and they will also stimulate the fibroblast so that these fibroblasts can then begin secreting collagen, and these collagen fibers potentially can form scar tissue. So if we look at the image below, we have our neutrophils. Take note of the cytoplasmic granules staining pink. Here we have our eosinophils and their cytoplasmic granules stain red. The basophils, note the cytoplasmic granules, the dark blue, dark purple. These three are your 
granulocytes followed by the agranulocytes. So here we have the lymphocyte. And if we compare that to the erythrocyte, you can see that they're about the same size, followed by the ginormous monocyte. And when compared to its neighbor, the erythrocyte, you can appreciate how large this monocyte is. How do we know it's called a monocyte? Because the red blood cells surround this monocyte. Okay, so let's see if we can identify these various formed elements that we find in blood. So let's begin with these cells. What do you think these cells are? And I'll give you a couple of seconds. Well, if you answered erythrocytes, you are correct. So we have millions of these erythrocytes. And of course, their function is to transport gases. So let's look at these formed elements right here. So what do you think these are? If you identified platelets, then you're correct as well. All right, let's try and do this one here. What are these cells? All right, so the correct answer is it is a neutrophil. Okay, notice the pinkish cytoplasmic granules and as well as the three to five lobed nucleus. All right, moving on to this cell, what could this possibly be? If you identified eosinophil, you're correct as well. So notice the red cytoplasmic granules because they absorb the eosin. That is why these cells are called eosinophils. All right, and what about this right here. If you wrote down lymphocyte, that is correct. All right, and the last one is this one. So this is a monocyte. Now why not a macrophage? Because the cell is found in blood. Now there's just a few things I just want to quickly mention. So often students get confused with the identification of a lymphocyte versus, let's say, a monocyte. The key distinguishing feature is the size. The lymphocyte is roughly about the size of a red blood cell or slightly bigger than a red blood cell. If you compare that to the monocyte, however, they are significantly larger than the red blood cell. And so you're looking at anywhere from three to four times larger than the red blood cell. Because these two are agranulocytes, you can't quite distinguish the two based on the color of their granules because these granules are not visible under the microscope because they're not as dense as the granulocytes. So when you have a monocyte and a lymphocyte, go by the size and compare them to that of the erythrocyte. So let's now look at the granulocytes. So we have one missing granulocyte. Can you figure out what that would be? If you answered basophils, you are correct. We have the neutrophils, we have the eosinophils, but this slide is not showing us the basophil because they only account, once again, for only 0.5 to 1% of all the leukocytes. Lastly, look at the platelets. Remember, these are cellular fragments of a megakaryocyte. So you're not expecting to see a whole cell like you would with a leukocyte. So when you're identifying the platelets, look for little tiny specks. So we will discuss the importance of platelets when it comes to the formation of a blood clot. So one of the unique characteristics of leukocytes that our red blood cells cannot do is the ability to migrate out of a blood vessel or out of the bloodstream. That process is referred to as emigration. So the E stands for exit. Now there are four steps in emigration. Number one is margination, where the white blood cell or the leukocyte will stick or adhere to the surface of the endothelium or the endothelial cell that forms the tunica intima, the inner lining of our blood vessels. After they marginate or stick, they'll roll 
and then eventually squeeze out, which is referred to as diapedesis. They do so by moving like an amoeba. So during the process of diapedesis, they have an amoeboid movement, which allows them to squeeze right through the intercellular clefts and the fenestrations. If you recall, when we talked about the different types of blood vessels, we have a continuous capillary, we have a fenestrated capillary, and we have the sinusoidal capillary. Let's look at this continuous capillary or a segment of a continuous capillary that I illustrated. So let's identify this white blood cell or leukocyte as the neutrophil, since they are the first leukocyte to arrive at the site of injury or where we have some type of disease-causing agent. So let's say bacteria. So here's my neutrophil, and what they'll express is a protein called integrin. And this integrin protein will stick to another protein that is expressed or that is displayed on the endothelial cell, which is referred to as selectin. So during the margination process, these two proteins, integrin and selectin, will stick together. Remember, this is referred to as margination. So once they stick, this white blood cell will roll. And as they roll, what they're looking for is a gap that allows them to leave blood and enter the interstitial fluid. So our disease-causing agent, once again, will be bacteria. So this neutrophil, the bacterial slayers, are meant to go to this bacteria to try and neutralize them by phagocytosis. So after they roll, the neutrophil will squeeze through the intercellular cleft. So eventually they'll find their way in the interstitial fluid, ready to phagocytose and consume this bacteria. So what we've looked at is step number one, margination, number two, rolling, and number three, diapedesis. Now they can also squeeze through the endothelial cell if it happens to be a fenestrated capillary. Over here is another image showing us the neutrophil. So if you look carefully, the green boxes represents integrin. And on the endothelial cell, they are displaying selected. So when they stick together through margination, neutrophil with endothelial cell because of integrin and selectin, then the neutrophil will roll. And as they're rolling, they're looking for that opening. And when they find it, they'll squeeze right through, diapedesis. This, of course, is a continuous capillary.